Okay, welcome to today's Lunch and Learn. It's a deep dive into market research. I'm Renee Miller, the program coordinator at the Oregon Bioscience Incubator. And we would like to give a special thank you to OHSU's Oregon Clinical and Translational Research Institute, or Oak Tree as it's called, as our collaborator for this program. And it's part of their Invent seminar series. We would also like to thank Commerce Bank for sponsoring today's Lunch and Learn, and we really appreciate their support. And with that, I would like to introduce Susan Kane from Commerce Bank to say a few words. Susan? Hi, good afternoon. My name is Susan Kane. I'm a commercial lender relationship manager at the Commerce Bank of Oregon. We're a small boutique bank located in downtown Portland, serving small to mid-sized businesses in Oregon and Southwest Washington. We help companies with their full treasury management and deposit needs, as well as loans from operating lines of credit, equipment lending to owner-occupied real estate. I'd be happy to answer any questions about your banking and meet with you for a cup of coffee virtually to discuss. And um, I'm just more than happy to be supporting Otrati today with this event. Wonderful, thank you, Susan. And now I would like to ask everyone to keep their microphones on mute uh, so that we have our full participant, our, um, be able to watch Michael McGarry give our talk today without any interruptions. And so I would like to introduce Michael McGarry who's leading today's program. And Michael is the president and founder of Forvita, a customer fo focused consulting firm that's passionate about developing health solutions that engage individuals and make health an everyday event. He is also one of our mentors in the OBI mentoring program. Thank you for presenting today, Michael. And if you're ready and you are, wanna share your screen, the floor is yours and I'll make you the spotlight speaker. Okay, great. Thank you, Renee. Uh, let's see if I can. Get this up and going here. All right, and I'll jump into. Okay. Looks good. So am I in, am I in presentation mode? I, I yes. can't see it on my screen. Okay, great. Uh, well, first off, thank you for inviting me to join you guys today. Um, wanted to kick it off first with a, a disclaimer. Uh, this is not a, a polished presentation that I've given a hundred times. Uh, it's, it's more or less just a brain dump uh, from 25 years of doing this on, on both buy side and the sell side. Uh, so I launched my consulting business about four years ago. Prior to that, spent uh, a good bit of time with Ascension Health, one of our larger health systems here, leading some of their innovation work and was really responsible for evaluating new technology as well as developing uh, new solutions in-house. Um, and then prior to that, uh, spent well over a decade on the medical device space, class three medical devices primarily, uh, cardiovascular stuff, stents, pacemakers. Um, so really have a, I've gotten sort of a deep lens on both how and why hospitals make decisions how they decide you know, where their dollars are going, but then also on the product side, understand where, where a lot of you guys are coming from uh, in, in trying to crack into that market. So um, with, with, with that disclaimer, we'll, uh, we'll jump right into it. So Ray said a little while back, there was a lunch and learn on, on what I'll call textbook market research. Um, you know, this is stuff, and I say textbook because it's literally stuff, you know, you go to the library, get a book on it. There's all kinds of resources out there on the internet to, to really help guide you when you want to do market research. What I really want to get into today though is kind of peeling back some of the layers of complexity in the health system, uh, focus uh, somewhat exclusively on the US health system, of course. Uh, it's not always easy to understand you know, who's your customer. So I'll introduce a, a few definitions that we'll, we'll walk through today. Uh, but first, just want to do a quick recap. This, this probably looks familiar to a lot of you. Uh, when you think about market research, you've got your primary research, which is firsthand information. You know, you gotta, you gotta get out there. You gotta meet people, you know, use your networks, um, go and talk to people. Don't just assume that what you're building, you know, helps people, makes the world a better place, improves quality. 
you know, get out there and really understand the, the nuances, not only of the market you're, you're entering, but also the, the customers you're engaging. And of course, secondary research is all the stuff you're going to do, you know, online, searching the data records, looking for, uh, it's a great place to do competitor analysis, um, pull that information together. Some of the tools that you, you know, you'll use for, for market research, interviews and focus groups, uh, I don't need to read, read the whole list to you here, but uh, you know, again, what I'm going to talk about today doesn't replace this. And in, in some ways, it augments it. In some ways, it's different, right? But I, I want to be very clear: uh, you know, doing textbook market research is critical, right? You need to understand your market. You need to understand your competitors. You need to understand, uh, you know, where you fit in that bigger picture. Uh, but what I wanted to focus on today, as I said, is who is your customer, right? And it's not always easy in, in healthcare um, to, you know, the, what, what you may think is obvious, you know, hey, this is a product that a doctor would use. So they're my customer, but that may not be the case. So just for the sake of this discussion, uh, I'll use these definitions. They, we can debate them later, but again, just for clarity on today, when I talk about a user, that's going to be an individual organization that is the one that's using your product. That might be a patient, that might be a caregiver, uh, that might be someone in IT, but that's going to be the, the, the person who's sort of hands-on and using your product. A champion is someone who's going to endorse or promote your product. So they may not use it on a daily basis, but they see what your product can do for their health system and they see it as critical to the success of what they're doing. They're gonna be that internal cheerleader that says, you know, we can't, we can't live without this product. A sponsor, uh, as I use that term, is someone that's gonna provide that executive support, right? So they're not gonna be the day-to-day -day cheerleader. They're not gonna be trying to knock down barriers inside the organization, but they're gonna, you know, it's gonna most likely be a CEO, a CFO, a, a chief medical officer, someone more senior in the organization that's going to say, you know what, this is aligned with what we're doing. I understand, you know, the, the benefits and needs and, you know, I endorse using this product. The customer, and this is again, just my opinion, is who's going to pay, right? At the end of the day, that's the question you're trying to answer as, a, as an early stage company is, uh, you may have all the positions of the world that love what you're doing. You might have champions that are promoting it. You might have users that want to use it. But if you don't have someone that's going to pay, the life of the company is going to be pretty short-lived. Um, uh, the only point I want to make here is uh, these roles are not necessarily mutually exclusive. An individual can, can assume multiple roles. Right? So someone can be both a user and a champion, et cetera. So uh, actually, Renee, I think one point we didn't make uh, – please don't wait until the end. I don't like to just hear myself talk, especially in this Zoom world where I, I'm just talking to a, a wall. Uh, we we, we wanna use the, the chat group or the chat function. So if you got a question or, or want some clarity or you know, introduce some comments, please use the, the chat function. And then Renee's monitoring that, she'll, uh, she'll interrupt me. So we can address those sort of as the, as the discussion progresses. Yes, absolutely. If you have any questions, just put, put it in the chat and I will interrupt Michael and... Um, then you can open your mic and have a conversation about it. Cool. Thank you, Renee. Um, just by way of example, right? How, how might these roles uh, play out? These are some, some companies I think are probably familiar to, to most of you, if not all of you, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. You know, who's the user? I think in this case, probably pretty straightforward. You, me, you know, all the people that are, are um, you know, willingly sharing all of their personal and, and uh, social data for all these companies to use. Who's the customer? The customer in this case for most of these companies is probably the companies are buying advertising, right? Uh, they're the one, you know, that, they're the one that are driving revenue for these companies until they switch to a subscription model. Um, you know, the customer is most likely that company that's the, the company that's buying the insights into who you are so that they can advertise to you. Um, does the user play more than one role? And in, the, in this case, I would argue, you're probably not only a user for these companies, you're actually part of the product, right? They're, these companies are trying to optimize your use of the platforms. 
they're trying to optimize the number of you know, minutes and hours you spend on the platform. They're trying to optimize the number of things you click. And so in that way, you're actually as much a part of the product as you are a user. And then the customer can play more than one role as well, right? The customer may actually be a user, right? They may be using the platform not only to, to, to advertise, but they may be uh, promoting their business with their own Facebook page or, or whatnot. So um, I just wanted to, to use this as a, a sort of a simple, very common example, something I think everyone's gonna be familiar with, just sort of sets the stage of, of what I wanna get into of, you know, sometimes user customer isn't, isn't as straightforward as you might think. Uh, the use case for today's discussion, uh, and this was an actual company that I did some work with uh, earlier this year, uh, we ended up getting COVIDed, if that's a verb. Um, and so we kind of shut down. It was an Australia-based company. We we're looking to break into the US market. Uh, it was a clinical decision support platform. And most of what I want to talk today is going to be heavily influenced by my work in the last decade, which is uh, really falls under the umbrella of digital health, right? So telemedicine, remote patient monitoring, customer you know, uh, health and consumer engagement. I think it applies, if I go back to my days on the medical device side of things, I think it applies as well, you know, the points I want to make today. Um, but if you're, you know, if you're bringing forth a new scalpel, if you're bringing forth, you know, a, a new and better improved, you know, four by four gauze pads, um, it's going to be a little more straightforward, right? There's established channels to, to get that product into the market. Um, you're going to become part of the hospital supply chain and it'll be pretty easy. Um, I shouldn't say pretty easy. It's never easy, right? But it'll be a little more straightforward. In the realm of digital health, though, um, you know, that's where the complexities of user customer, just like the examples I, I gave with Facebook and Instagram, um, they, the, those lines get a little bit more blurred. Um, so let me just, uh, just so that everybody's on the same page, clinical decision support, um, do I get into that here? Yeah, I think I get into that a little bit here. Hold on, my screen's blocking. Uh, or my, my Zoom's blocking my screen here. So I'll explain a little bit about, about what clinical decision support systems are, just so you guys have context. Some of you may be familiar with them, um, but for the benefit of everyone, I'll just give a little, little highlight. So the first question I ask myself when, when I'm trying to unpack sort of who are those different people in the organization? Who's that user? Who's that champion? Uh, 20 questions, uh, again, brain dump. It, it could be 22 questions. It could be 19. Um, but for today, we'll, we'll walk through 20 of them. What is the benefit of your product? You know, what's the problem you're solving? And, and you don't need to overthink this one, right? It's, it's pretty straightforward. Why did you start your company, right? What are you trying to do? Uh, the use case uh, that we're talking about here, human error is a leading challenge for most hospitals, right? It's fueled primarily by siloed data systems and fractured communication between teams, right? So the cardiology team doesn't know what the endocrinology team is doing. Uh, data gets misplaced, uh, data is not delivered in real time. So that can lead to a number of errors, be they medication errors, be they uh, lab errors, be they, uh, you know, we didn't get the lab results in time. So we, we did something else. Uh, you know, I think most health systems would admit, it would admit that, you know, it's a, it's a real challenge. And uh, clinical decision support systems aggregate data from multiple systems across. So your EMRs, your um, your marketing systems, um, some of your uh, uh, enrollment platforms, billing systems, all these things all come together to create a real-time dashboard of patient activities. So we can pull, you know, in real time, lab data as it happens, bed utilization data as it happens, hospital admits as it happens. And we can bring that all together into one common uh, dashboard that gives really anyone in the health system uh, at, a gla at a glance view of what's going on, not only at the individual patient level, but also at the more macro health system level. Uh, so the problem, you know, the, the benefit of this product is addressing that, addressing uh, the human error that, that is common in, in health systems. Number two, what is the key value proposition of your product? And so this is a little bit different than the first question of, you know, what problem are you trying to solve? If you're trying to, prob if you're trying to solve a problem that doesn't have perceived value, 
then you, know, you need to kind of really think, you know, who am I selling into and, and, and what am I trying to, uh, what am I trying to get done? So the value proposition, well, as I say, cash is king, but other ways to define a return on value. And I'm, I'm keen to use that term return on value because it's not always return on investment. You know, as I say, cash is king, dollars are always going to dominate. So what are we spending? What are we getting back? Is it cost savings? Um, is it new revenue? Um, but there may be other things. We're driving efficiency. Uh, we're driving physician satisfaction. Uh, a number of other ways that value can be measured. You're going to get, you're going to grab the, the biggest share of attention though, if you can show direct impact on cost savings or revenue, in my opinion. Uh, the softer targets are great and always great to add them into your pitch or your, you know, your, 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 your product de your demonstration. Um, you know, but I would focus on, you know, where are you driving revenue, where are you saving money? So in our use case, the CDS platform, it improves efficiency, right? So we're gonna get greater patient throughput, bed utilization, those kinds of things. It improves quality, right? We're gonna, we're gonna reduce errors and improve overall care quality. Um, that's gonna indirectly drive, both these things are gonna indirectly drive cost savings we really aren't going to drive new revenue though. I'll, I'll get to a, a scenario where we might a little bit later on in the chat. Um, but you know, this play was really about cost savings, right? And so there's only a few people in an organ in a health system that really care about cost savings. Um, you know, it's probably your CFO and CEO, um, your, your clinicians, your patients, they're going to understand why it's important, but they're not necessarily going to drive their decision based on, hey, this is saving the health system a few bucks, so I should use this instead of that, right? Um, so understanding that, that value proposition is you know, really getting to the heart of that, that balance of give and take, right? You're gonna ask the health system or your customer to give something, give their time, give their dollars. They're gonna need something in return. Be very clear on what it is you're returning to them. Who are all the stakeholders? And, and think beyond the obvious. Here, does your product, what I mean by does your product create a ripple effect is, especially in the realms of, of digital health, you don't, uh, you might think immediately stakeholders, well, it's going to be your, uh, your, your, your CIO, your, your chief informatics officer, um, it's going to be your clinicians, it's going to be your patient, uh, right? But for, for the clinical decision support system, the use case that I'm talking about here, you know, it's, it's patients, it's caregivers both the clinicians, right? The licensed caregivers, as well as the family, right? Um, there was an extension, there was a inability for uh, the patients to allow others to, to have a view into what their, uh, you know, what their healthcare data looked like. The chief information officer, the CFO, your, your quality officers, uh, your nurses and care coordinators, uh, HR, and you think, well, what does HR have to do this? Well, we can drive higher physician satisfaction, which is a huge thing for health systems to drive retention of their, of their care teams, right? Um, so HR might be really interested in what this product's gonna do. Uh, legal, uh, kind of goes hand in hand with improved quality, uh, reduced litigation, right? Fewer, fewer hum, human errors, less litigation. Uh, operations, right? Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna maximize patient throughput. And then perhaps marketing, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, well, towards the end, I want to discuss uh, the concept of a halo effect. Um, you know, but you, you know, again, you might be wondering, oh, well, you know, what does marketing have to do with a, a clinical decision support system? And it gives the marketing department a lens into the patient, unlike they've ever had before, right? They get to really build a much deeper relationship with the customer that creates opportunity um, for them to engage. When you think about, I'm going to use the term customer somewhat generically here, but you know, when you when you think about your customer, where are they located? Um, so in the realm of things like telemedicine, um, there's state by state regulations um, that have an impact on how you can deliver telemedicine. And so when you're thinking about where you might go first, right? I'm going to go to Texas. I'm going to go to California. You know, you, you probably can't cover the whole country at once. Excuse me. Uh, for some products, are there, are there cultural considerations? Uh, I was doing a health engagement platform a number of years ago. Um, it was around you know, diet and exercise, those kinds of things. Um, you know, we really had to take cultural considerations into play and that the, the food 
primarily the food, but some of the, you know, the, the food we were recommend recommending, uh, the language we were using, it was primarily English and Spanish. But if you're entering into a geography that has a, a high concentration of, of other, uh, you know, other languages spoken, you know, that may influence where you go and, and the health systems you seek to engage with early on. In the case of the, the uh, clinical decision platform, uh, we were looked at the whole US. Um, as, as far as that software is concerned, there's no state by state limitations. We did have a focus on urban centers, right? It, it was difficult in, in sort of your, your smaller, more rural settings to show that value, to really demonstrate the value proposition. They simply, you know, rural, rural systems just simply didn't have the patient volume to drive the, uh, the cost savings that, that we would want to, uh, want to show. The other piece here, well, so in my note down below, competitive markets, you know, know not only who you're talking to, but know what their competitors are doing. Um, you know, especially when you get into the urban setting, a lot of health systems are in highly competitive markets, right? Really trying to, to, to steal market share uh, you know, from their neighboring health systems. You can use that to your advantage. Um, you can give a health system, uh, you know, features and functions that their competitor may not. Um, they may or may not ask for, for exclusivity. Um, you know, I would, I would caution against that, um, but they can definitely have a first mover advantage, right? And so you can use those insights to your advantage when you're, when you're talking to a potential customer. Um, the other piece here are global considerations. The U.S. may not be the best market. Uh, when we think about value-based care uh, or single-payer systems, you, know, you might actually want to consider, are there markets outside the U.S. that would be a better entry for your product? Um, as I mentioned earlier, though, for the, for the sake of this discussion, um, this is sort of a, a very U.S.-centric view. What is the optimal size? Um, so think about what you need to demonstrate your value proposition, right? Do you need scale? Do you need, uh, and a lot of times in digital health, you do, you need thousands and thousands of users. If it's, a, if it's an AI or machine learning uh, program, you, know, you need to train those, those algorithms, right? So you need large volumes of, of, of customers or end users. Um, would you benefit from central decision-making? And, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but what I mean there is, uh, you know, the years that I spent with Ascension, uh, you know, it was a 30 plus billion dollar health system operating uh, across 23 states, 150,000 employees. I would strongly advise you don't go to them as your first customer. Um, the scale seems incredible. And everyone's like, oh, that'd be so cool if I land Ascension as a, as a customer. Um, but it'll take you a year, maybe two years just to find the right people to talk to. And I always chuckled when I had some folks that would come to me and say, you know, I'd be at a conference or something. They'd be like, oh, you know, that, that, that's cool. You're with Ascension. I, I work with Ascension too. And they say, really? You know, who do you, who do you work with? And they say, well, do you know Dr. Jones? I was like, you know, of, of the 30,000 physicians that we have, I, I don't know Dr. Jones. And let me just, in, in a very polite way, but, you know, let me help you understand. You're not working with Ascension. You're actually just working with, with Dr. Jones, right? So central decision-making becomes really powerful in that uh, I have a bias towards sort of mid-size, uh, and as you'll see in the use case, that's who we targeted, mid-size, sort of one to seven billion dollars in revenue, regionally located, single EMR, right? So you're not dealing with, with competing platforms or data systems, and then central decision-making, right? Uh, Ascension has a CEO and a CFO and a CMO for every one of their, what they call health ministries in every single market. So you might be able to sell to one of them but you're not gonna then sell to all of them. You might be able to sell to corporate, but then corporate can't necessarily uh, insist or demand that all of the health systems use whatever you just sold to corporate. So really focusing on those mid-sized systems allows you to find uh, in, the, in the world of Goldilocks, right? Um, not too big, not too small. Um, you can get to faster decisions, but still have the scale that might benefit um, you know, demonstrating your value proposition. Does your product create the need for new jobs? And, and then, you know, this is both good and bad. Um, if you create new jobs, you're gonna have some folks in the health system that might say, you know, job growth, this is good. Um, you know, uh, it, it might be justification for them to bring on new employees that they can, they can use in more than one department. 
right? So understand if you need new people in an organization to support your product. Where it's bad, of course, is, it, it, you know, you got to sell them on not just your product, but you got to sell them on the need to, to bring in new jobs. And if, you know, a lot of, especially today with, with what's going on with COVID, a lot of health systems have a hiring freeze um, or they're, they're, they're downsizing actually. Um, you know, so as an example, you know, the use case uh, of the CDS platform, uh, if the health system didn't have a really strong data analytics team, it was strongly encouraged that they, they did bring that, that talent in house. Um, the, the company could, could get them up and running, um, but wouldn't manage the system, manage the data on an ongoing basis. So you really, you know, in that, in that scenario, we really needed a robust data analytics team, which isn't common necessarily for, it's becoming more and more common, but you know, not every health system has one. So be, be aware of, you know, what support you're going to need for your product. And if it exists with, with some of the customers that you're, you're entertaining, having discussions with. On the flip side of that, does your product eliminate jobs? And again, this is both a good and bad thing. Uh, it, it may be good for the CFO who says, hey, we can cut costs. We can eliminate, a few, you know, eliminate some of the headcount. Of course, if, if you're the person or the department that might be facing job elimination because of the new product, uh, you might find them a, a point of resistance uh, within the organization. So again, it's neither good nor bad. Just understand how that product you're bringing into a health system is gonna impact the bigger picture, right? Impact the overall health system, not just the user that might benefit from the product. Um, so for the CDS platform, it, it wasn't likely um, that we would, would eliminate jobs, uh, but perception of job loss is real, right? And, and I talk about this a little bit later, uh, this notion of, of antibodies, but the perception of job loss uh, you know, there's a real fear. So this was a, a, an AI driven platform, right? So this question of, will I be replaced by AI, clinical decision support, you know, physician thinking, well, you know, am I gonna be out of a job and, and be replaced by this really smart computer? And in some cases, it's absolutely absurd that they, you know, that, that individuals would think that way because there's, you know, computers, there's some places computers just can't replace someone. Um, but it doesn't stop people from having that perception and that can become a barrier for, for getting that champion uh, or getting that sponsor on board to really help drive your product, you know, into the system, not only through the sale, but, but implementation and, and uh, you know, scaling of that product. Um, so be mindful of, you know, again, not only the, the real, but the perceived impact because uh, that can influence people's decisions. Michael? Oh, yeah. Pardon me. Sorry to interrupt. Jennifer Greenberg has a question. Can you talk a bit more about the role of uncertainty in change and product adoption cycle? And Jennifer, if you wanna open up your mic and add any more to that, you're welcome to do so. Yeah, hey, Michael, I think what you were saying was really key, right? Is that people start to imagine things and make things up in their head if they don't, if they don't know what's going to happen. And I was, and um, you touched on that a little bit. And I wondered if you had any more thoughts about that, because I think it's so important. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, you're, you're kind of leading into, I think it's in, in one or two questions I get into that is, um, you know, in addition to sort of job creation, job loss, um, you know, where are you gonna introduce some pain points, right? Uh, clinical workflows uh, was one I think you mentioned, right? Uh, EMRs are probably the classic example here, right? They, they were supposed to be the savior of, of health systems and, and make the lives of clinicians a hundred times better. And they've been nothing but a nightmare. It's a huge generalization, right? But they required all kinds of workflow changes. They required all kinds of training. They require massive amounts of, of data input and data entry on behalf of the physicians. You know, some physicians estimate they spend 50% of their time just entering stuff into a, into a medical record, um, completely opposite of what the promise of EMRs, you know, claim to, to bring to the table. Um, so the, the, the negative impacts, let me think about if that's the right, to say negative impacts, right? But the... Uh, you know, just, just be really aware of how your product is gonna impact the whole system, right? Not just, not just one user. Um, I think we tend to get really granular and, and focus on so sort of that patient physician relationship, um, you know, but I think it's so critical to, to recognize 
the health system is an entire ecosystem. And when you introduce, you know, just a little wave in one department, it, it may carry over uh, in, into multiple arenas. Um, you know, if there's a, a theme at all today, I think that that would probably be it. Does that, does that get close to addressing your question? I'm, I'm going to hit, hit it a little bit more sure. um, in a few sure. questions too. Okay. Uh, well, we'll even hear the, the eighth question, who will you help and how? Um, you know, the obvious is a, is a health benefit, right? Um, the, the use case, uh, you know, reduced human error is not only great for the health system, it's great for the patient, right? <laughs> Who's not subject to that error. Um, we're gonna save time. We're gonna reduce complexity in the long term. Um, you know, but, but, but getting to the, the prior question, um, we're probably gonna introduce some complexity in the near term, right? During that implementation phase. Um, I think we covered some of this other stuff, reduce litigation, increase capacity for hospital cost savings. You know, those are all the benefits that, that we wanna talk about. And again, they span the entire organization for this product, not just the patient who's gonna, or the, the clinician who's gonna make less errors and the, and the patient who benefits from that. Um, who are you hurt and how? The two biggest areas that I see this uh, are added work and added cost. Um, you know, EMRs not only, hit both of these buttons, right? <laughs> Added work for so many people in the organization, but while they claim to reduce costs, and, and I think in some areas they do, uh, you know, every time you need to upgrade your EMR as a health system, uh, God, I wanna remember the numbers. I, I wanna say for Ascension, it was a $50 million project to upgrade their, uh, their, their EMR across the system, right? Uh, you know, so unless you can back up those added costs with immense savings, it's gonna be a really tough sell. Um, so in the case of our clinical decision support system, uh, it was definitely added work for, for IT up front, both in implementation, uh, you know, getting the platform in-house, getting it set up on everyone's computers. Uh, it was a challenge with integration. If you remember, I said, you know, one of, the, one of the strengths of the decision support system is it pulls data from multiple sources and aggregates it in one. But that doesn't happen automatically, right? It was a it requires a fairly sizable integration effort, uh, which is going to take a, a a lot of or it's going to put a lot of burden on the hospital IT system. Even if the hospital IT system uh, sees that, you know, sees the value in the product, it, arguably they've got twenty other high priority projects in their queue, and they may say that maybe this is great, but I just we just can't get to it this year, right? So understand how that, that's gonna impact it. Uh, and then the other piece, and I think this gets uh, a little bit to the question of workflows is you know, it's gonna require training for, for multiple departments. So this gets into your operations teams, your HR teams, right? Um, it's rare that you just drop a product into a health system and you know, have people adopt it and use it the next day, right? Um, it's gotta be integrated into the clinical workflows, training, people have to know how to use it. There's a lot of people that aren't gonna you know, they can be resistant to learning just because of the, the time they have. And so they're going to be making, you know, they're going to, ah, this, this product's crap and it's hard to use because they didn't take the time to train. That's going to introduce complexity. HR is going to hear about it. You know, oh, this is terrible. IT is going to hear about it. This program is, you know, this, this, this platform is crap. I hate it. When it's probably tied to, to user error, <laughs> you know, the, the product might be great, um, but the users weren't appropriately trained. And you know, as soon as IT starts hearing those complaints, you're, you're starting to lose one of your champions inside the organization, right? So be really mindful of sort of the negative impact of where your product might, might have across the organization. Uh, where are the antibodies? And I, I mentioned this earlier, and I think I just, you know, they're most likely in the places where you're going to hurt someone, right? <laughs> so, so know the bigger picture, right? So I, and I think I just walked through this a little bit. Uh, in the use case, it's, it's definitely gonna be on a case by case basis, right? So every, every health system, you know, the, the running joke in the industry is if you work with one health system, you work with one health system, right? They all have their unique challenges. They all have their, their unique uh, governance structure, sort of how their, uh, how their teams are set up, you know, so you, you, you can't make a blanket statement of, you know, oh, the IT department's always gonna be the, you know, the antibody for a new, new IT program. Um, you know, it's, it's really going to be, you have to know your audience. Um, I, you know, I say it, it's, it's likely your, your chief medical officer in, in IT, 
again, a, a massive generalization that I'm reluctant to put out there, but I, I did. Um, you know, your chief medical officer is really going to be looking at, you know, how their physicians are performing. Are they happy in their job? What kind of retention do I have? Uh, are we delivering, you know, quality care? And then IT is going to be responsible for putting a lot of this stuff in there. Uh, your quality departments might be another area. Um, be mindful of, you know, recognizing you're not the only product that's trying to sell into this health system. So be mindful that there are competing budgets. Um, I've had a number of projects that I had tremendous support for internally, but someone else had a little bit more support for something else. And there's only so many dollars in the health system, right? So it, it may not be that they don't like your product. It may be they simply like one or two others a little bit more and that's all the budget they have for, you know, to, to put something new into the system. Uh, competing research agendas, again, these can work for and against you. Um, you know, if you've got uh, the chief medical officer is, is really hell bent on sort of driving the organization in a certain direction, you want to know that, right? You want to know, um, is this a, an individual that can really become a, a sponsor of this product, a champion of this product, or is their head somewhere where else, right? So that's where the antibodies are going to pop up. Uh, you know, recognizing that you probably have 10 times the number of no's in an organization as you do the number of yeses, right? And it's not because, again, they, you know, people don't see the value in your product. It's just that they're trying to get something else done and, and recognizing it's a closed ecosystem and they can only do so much at any given point in time. So, you know, know the bigger picture, do your homework, talk to multiple groups across the organization, not just what you, you know, not just who you see as your perceived uh, user. Building on that, are you aligned with the strategic priorities of the organization? And, and this one I found to be really important. Um, uh, CHNA, a, a community health needs assessment, virtually every hospital has to, has to uh, complete one of these. I think they do them every three years. It's a great place to start, right? Understand the needs of the broader community, not, not just the health system, but what's going on in the market that that health system is serving. Right, so uh, is there a big challenge with uh, you know diabetes? Is there a big challenge with with obesity, substance abuse, um, access to care? You know, understanding sort of those macro challenges and the strategic priorities of the health system will really help you identify if this is a a good place for you to to place your bets. Right, um, it's pretty easy to get into a health system and, and get a physician on board with what you're doing you know, especially if it's a product that helps their patients and helps them personally. But if the, the product you're trying to get into the health system isn't aligned with the greater strategic priorities of the organization, I think it's a fair bet to say you'll probably encounter more antibodies, more people that'll say no, again, not because they don't like the product, but because they're trying to get other stuff done and they only have so much bandwidth. Um, you know, IT is going to be the classic example here if you're trying to implement, um, you know, a digital health platform uh, you know, IT is just buried usually and have a backlog of projects and they're not really excited to take on new stuff, uh, especially when they know anytime they take on something new, it's probably going to create <laughs> some, some, some friction and pain points down the road, right? I think we all are fairly believing in the fact that, you know, software just doesn't go the way. It, there's always going to be some bugs and errors and whatever, right? So um, really take the time to understand uh, those strategic priorities, read press releases, read, uh, you know, the, the, the health system's websites. Um, and the word of caution there is a lot of health systems will talk, you know, what they do isn't necessarily what they say. So their, their, their websites and some of the public facing sides of the health system are going to be, you know, big picture, improve the health of the community type stuff. But, you know, find some nurses, find some folks that are on the front line, find out what they think the strategic priorities are for the organization, right? And, and those folks are gonna be a little bit easier to access. Uh, you go to the hospital cafeteria and just camp out, <laughs> you know, and, and spark up a conversation with anybody that'll talk to you, right? Understand, uh, you know, sort of the, the nuts and bolts of the health system. Um, for, for the use case we're, we're walking through here, uh, you know, it, it's really easy to say, and, and I present this, this use case as a sort of a cautionary tale, it's really easy to say this clinical decision support system is aligned with the quadruple aim of virtually every health system, right? We want to improve quality and outcomes. Uh, we want to reduce costs. We want to improve the patient experience. 
And we also want to improve the clinical experience, right? We want to make sure our, our doctors and nurses are happy. Um, but you can't stop there. You can't just say, oh, well, we, you know, we hit the, the quadruple aim, so, so we're in. Um, each, health, each health system is going to focus on those efforts a little bit differently, and they're going to prioritize how they're going to do it. Are they going to do it with remote care? Are they going to do it with um, quality improvement? Are they going to do it with um, you know, uh, a new facility? You know, are they going to do it with adding um, new services? Right? Understand, again, at that deeper level, where they want to go. I say here, you know, it doesn't have to be the CEO, right, that you want to sell on this, but it doesn't hurt, right? If, if you can get the CEO on board with what you're doing and, and, and demonstrate how you're aligned with the strategic priorities that that individual has set for the organization, they become a great, great champion and, and sponsor of your product. Um, does your product create new opportunities to drive revenue? Uh, you know, here, it doesn't have to be the CFO, but again, doesn't hurt, right? The CFO is going to be the one that's most concerned about how the dollars and cents are flowing through the health system. Um, you know, this again, continues on this notion of think bigger than just what your product does. Um, you know, in the use case here, the clinical decision support platform, uh, the, the, the logical evolution for this is to drive deeper relationships and extended care beyond the hospital, right? So the near-term win for this product is get in, understand what's going on in real time, and serve that information up to the right people so they can make better decisions. But as you're aggregating all this data, you're getting a much deeper understanding of your patient. You're getting a much deeper understanding of how your health system can engage with them, which opens up the door for whether it be outreach and marketing activities, whether it be uh, extended care platforms, right? So extending beyond the services you, you offer inside the, the brick and mortars of the health system um, to remote care. So building a case around that of, you know, here's what my product does for you today, but here's what it can do for you in the future uh, becomes a compelling, compelling pitch, um, you know, for most, in the, uh, for most people in the health system. Um, what are the switching or integration costs? Uh, you know, don't try and replace an EMR for as much as everyone hates them you know, you're talking about a two to three year sales cycle to try and get that done, right? So again, understand, um, you know, what are the products that the, the health system's using today? And if they're gonna have to switch that out for what you're providing, how painful is it to remove that existing product? Uh, and then integration, I think we, we hit on that a little bit earlier. Um, you know, the, the more systems you have to connect to, the more uh, departments of the, of the hospital you have to um, kind of become part of, the more work you're introducing. So, so just be careful of, you know, what are they, you know, what are they using and what are you trying to replace if, if you are um, here, you know, I say it doesn't have to be the, the CIO, the chief, uh, chief innovation or chief information officer, separate, separate eyes in the, the CIO title, um, you know, but it doesn't hurt, especially in the realm of, of digital health, right? That's probably the key, for, key person you want to focus in on. Um, does your product require workflow changes or training? Uh, and in the case of, the clinical decision support, yes and yes. Uh, and I think we hit on this a little bit earlier. So I'll, uh, in the interest of time, um, you know, move quickly past this. But, you know, again, just be mindful of, you know, health systems have systems that they've probably had in place for a year or longer. And that change management process can be a real nightmare, right? So you want to understand their existing workflows and demonstrate how your product works within those, not disrupts those. Uh, you know, here it doesn't have to be your chief medical officer. Yeah, but it doesn't hurt, right? That, that's probably the, the, the folks there, chief nursing officer, chief medical officer, uh, the folks that are really responsible for the day-to-day the -day, uh, delivery of care uh, are probably gonna be the most impacted and, and likely become your greatest antibodies um, if you're gonna disrupt that, that existing workflow. How long does it take to demonstrate measurable value? And this, co this goes back to, I think it was, you know, the, the second question is, is what's your value proposition? Uh, you know, the note I have here, if, it, if it's more than 12 months, rethink your product or value proposition. Um, <clears throat> especially as we move towards value-based care, there's a lot of new products and services coming to market that are saying, you know, diabetes management is a, is a great example. Uh, hundreds of products that seem to be coming on the market to, for, for diabetes management. But in, with the exception of sort of your really late stage, sort of heavy using 
health, you know, diabetes patients, you know, multiple comorbidities, et cetera. Um, the return on savings for a diabetic is probably measured more in five to 10 years than in 12 months. And, and why that's critical is the hospitals operate on a, on a 12 month fiscal year, right? And so they're gonna be putting dollars out this year to pay for your product. They may not realize those dollars for another five years. That's a really tough sell. Uh, so understanding that, you know, that rev cycle uh, becomes critically important uh, when you're thinking about how you're going to position your product, you know, within that, that audience. Um, as we switch to, as I said, to value-based care, uh, when you look at fully integrated health systems, you know, they're going to get a better sense of the long-term value, the, the lifetime value of a customer, those kinds of things. Um, so you probably want to target your efforts there. Um, you know, if, if your return on value is more than 12 months, I'd all but abandon any discussions with health systems that are still primarily fee for service. Um, and and value-based care is, is definitely the buzzword. I think everyone believes it is the wave of the future. My personal opinion, we're, we're probably 10 years away from it uh, being sort of the common means of, of delivering care though. So we're, we're still very much in a fee for service world and, and will be for, for quite some time. Um, you know, in the use case uh, for the clinical decision support system, um, that platform could demonstrate efficiencies in the first month and improvements in quality in the first quarter, right? So a really great fit. That's a pretty easy sell uh, to demonstrate that, that return on value. Uh, are they potentially strategic partners? Uh, again, thinking beyond just the users and the direct benefits of, you know, how is this health system going to help you or how can you help them? in a way beyond that, that customer vendor relationship, right? I think I have a, yeah, so this, is a, this just came across my desk uh, last couple of days. This is Tampa General Hospital, uh, leading academic medical center launches new venture capital fund, Tampa General Hospital InnoVentures, right? You're seeing this, especially in mid-sized health systems. You're seeing this every day. Every health system is, is popping up these innovation centers. What I really, really love about that is it provides a front door you know, for you to get into. So, uh, you know, these are, these are groups that are not only going to help you identify sort of who those stakeholders are in the organization, um, they're help drive implementation, uh, but more importantly, they may become an investor of your company uh, as, as things go on, right? Um, so can they be more than a customer? Can they be a strategic partner um, is a critical question uh, that I try and understand. What's going on in the world, right? You know your audience, know their problems. Uh, an obvious example right now is COVID-19. I was, I was working on a, uh, a project uh, for about a year and a half. And in February of this year, it vaporized in about a week. Uh, I had six health systems involved. We were literally on the, using a football analogy, we were on the, the one yard line. Uh, we were negotiating some sort of final contract agreements and then COVID hit and completely wiped out that year and a half of work. Uh, you know, the shift of value-based care, I talked about that a little bit, right? Where is that health system that you want to talk to? Where are they on that journey? Uh, if they're heavily fee-for-service, know that. If they've got a ton of um, risk-based contracts, you know, know that. That's going to influence who you talk to and what you talk to them about. Um, for the clinical decision support system, uh, ROI is optimized for both value-based care and fully integrated health networks, right? So that's, that's who we were targeting there. We didn't even touch fee-for-service. Um, be consultative. Then the note I have here, help them to see the bigger picture, right? Help them become a better health system. It's not always just about, can I sell my product in to your organization? It's how can we build a relationship and together make this care experience better, right? How can we build a better system together? Uh, I found to be very effective, right? Um, so, so focus on long-term relationships, not short-term transactions. Oh, I might've just given away the answer. Um, are there any, any unintended consequences? And this is always a fun one, right? Cause you get laser focused on what it is you can do, um, but there may be some, some unintended consequences and, and hopefully in a good way, right? <laughs> um, you want to know if there's some, some, some negative ones as well, but um, you know, for the, the clinical decision support system, I think I had on this already, you know, we, we really drive a deeper understanding of clinical workflows and patient experience, provides insight into care uh, that can deliver, or into care delivery models, 
and allows for rapid testing of new ones, right? So once this platform is populated with, you know, a year, two, three years worth of data, it becomes an incredible system for the hospital to try a new care delivery model and then rapidly test that. Is that impacting quality? Is that, in, in, you know, improving care? Um, so that would be sort of an unintended consequence of that. Um, one of the best examples that I, 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 I think I've come across in, in my life in this industry here is um, a question to the group. Again, hard to, hard to answer this in, in Zoom, but you know, what's the most successful health engagement app of all time? And you've got some real great contenders out there, your Fitbits and Apple Watches and um, Whoop is a new one that's out there. You know, all these platforms and products that are focused on health engagement and trying to get people to improve their, their health behaviors. But I would argue probably the best health engagement application of all time was Pokemon Go. Um, it was a game. But when you look at the data, they added thousands and thousands of steps to millions and millions of people within the first month or two of launching that, that platform, right? Um, so don't get so laser focused on the immediate benefit. Think about, you know, what, what ripple effect you're going to have, where you might have additional benefit beyond the obvious. And then, you know, getting into that, that, that oh, so critical question is who's going to pay and don't just make assumptions. Um, you know, the doctor's going to pay, the patient's going to pay out of pocket, you know, the hospital's going to pay. Um, get your hypothesis, get your assumptions, and then go validate that. You know, get into the hospital and talk to the CFO, talk to, um, you know, the, the, the CMO, whoever, you know, there's going to be harder folks to get to, um, you know, but I, I can't tell you how many early stage companies uh, that I'm in discussions with and they're like, well, you know, yeah, the you know, patients are going to pay out of pocket rarely the answer, you know, physicians are going to pay almost never the answer, right? So what this all boils down to is that is who's going to pay? Who's going to pay for that product? Um, and you need to find who that person is and then convince them with your users, your champions, and your sponsors. So again, I would say the customer is the one that's going to pay, but you need this other, uh, other body of, 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 of folks they're gonna stand behind your product and say, you know, I absolutely think we need to use this. It's great for the organization, um, you know, so that that customer, the one that's gonna pay has all the justification they need to, to make that purchasing decision. So um, sort of in summary um, for the clinical decision support system, I would break it down this way. Our, our users were the clinicians and IT. Our champions were going to be the quality teams and the, the chief medical team or the you know, chief medical officer. The sponsor is probably going to be the CFO. You know, I would want to sell that CFO on the cost savings. Uh, and the customer is going to be the CEO because that, the, the decision support platform really spanned the entire organization and had broad impact on uh, you know, the care delivery. Um, and so at the end of the day, we felt we would have needed CEO buy-in uh, to authorize the, you know, the purchase of that that product. Um, now, after that, you know, CEO would rarely be involved and, and have nothing to do with the product. Um, but that was the person we needed to sell, for sure, um, with that product. And then the final one, uh, sort of a bonus question, uh, I thought of this after my 20 questions is, does your product provide a halo effect? And, and what I mean by that, that gets into uh, hospitals that are in, in, you know, competing systems, you know, their perception to the community matters. So, you know, are you the first to deliver uh, your robotic surgeries? Are you reducing ER wait times? Are you, you know, are you giving the health system something that they can promote to their broader community that makes them look better, right? That halo effect. By using this product, your health system will have a more positive representation in the community, right? And here I say it doesn't have to be the chief marketing officer, um, but it doesn't hurt, right? Chief marketing officers are always looking for a way that they can position their health system in a way that's better than the, the competitors in the market. Um, I think that's, that's what I got today with five minutes to spare. Thank you, Michael. This was really great. Um, I love the, the bigger look, the wider look at the ripple effects and who the product 
benefits and who it doesn't benefit. And a lot of questions to think about that maybe um, early stage businesses, companies didn't consider and should consider. Does anyone have any questions for Michael? Um, feel free to just open up your microphone and ask. Um, Nick is asking if the slides will be available. Yes, I will send the slides um, along with the recording and I'll send that out probably tomorrow. So while I'm waiting for questions to um, come through the chat or someone to open up their microphone, I'm just going to put up a quick poll and I would appreciate if you could fill it out. Um, it is a survey poll that we always ask whenever we do a lunch and learn, and it is to help improve our programs and events. And um, I would love it if you would answer those, just those four questions. And if anybody has any questions for Michael, you've covered a lot of material. Um, 20 questions, all very important, all different. Um, really some great deep dive into um, market research in a different kind of way, you know, really finding out who's your, who's your customer, who's your user, who's paying for this, and how is it going to impact the organizations as a whole. Um, Skip Rung asked, what is the first top clue that a customer isn't going to work out? <laughs> oh God, great question. Um, I would, dis you know, you're gonna get the first clue and I would completely disregard it. Um, and then you're gonna get a second clue and I would completely disregard that. Um, you know, it, it goes into those antibodies, right? Um, you might be talking to a chief financial officer and realize after the first conversation, you know, you need to be talking to the chief medical officer, right? So I, I don't want to pretend like there's some blueprint that you can follow. Um, it's really going to be on a, a customer, by, customer by customer basis. Um, you know, so the, the first clue that you maybe pay attention to is, is the, the accumulation of maybe three or four or five clues, <laughs> right? Of people saying, eh, I don't think it's a good fit, but don't give up with that. Just because the CFO says it's not a good fit, don't give up on that. Right, go talk to somebody else in the health system. Okay, good. Uh, Carlos asked, how do you get to the hospital CEO? It isn't gonna be simple. It, it's not, right? And so that's what I was saying. Uh, and, and a great question because there's a, it's, it becomes really tactical. Um, you know, through, through those health innovation centers that all of these, you know, that so many health systems are, are setting up, that's a great way. Um, you know, but you, you probably do need to start from the bottom up, right? So build those champions, build those sponsors. Um, you know, if, if you can get to a doctor, if you can get to a, a, a nurse, if you can get to someone that's sort of mid-level and win them over and then sort of build. Um, but the likelihood you're gonna just ring the CEO and, and get a meeting in a week is, is almost zero, right? So great question and, and great clarification. Uh, I really view this as a, as a bottom up process. You know, start wherever you can get in and then just keep winning people in the organization until you get to where you need to go. Excellent, good. Karen Berg asks, thank you, or she says, thank you for openly sharing your knowledge. And then she asks, what success stories do you have in generating warm introductions to the medical center venture capital funds you're talking about? Uh, you know, again, what's, what's great about those those organizations is they're actually out looking for you, right? <laughs> they probably have someone in there who has their sole job. Like when I, when I was uh, at Ascension, it wasn't my sole job, but 30% of my job description was scanning and networking, right? I was out there looking for the next best thing. Uh, we, were, we were developing stuff in-house, but a big part of it was finding the, the you know, the, knowing the problems we're trying to solve as an organization and going and finding those solutions. Right. So um, they're, that's going to be the, one of the most likely areas where they are going to return your email. They're going to return a phone call. Uh, if they're geographically close to you, you know, make the two hour drive, <laughs> you know, and, and just go walk in the front door. Um, but if, you know, you, sh you should get a warm reception 
from those teams because again that's their job uh, and what I really really love about that is you know 10 years ago it was, it was virtually it was so uncommon um, that a health system would have that those capabilities that uh, one of the biggest problems I tried to solve at Ascension in the early days was creating a front door right creating that that entry where an early stage company could walk into and you know, and get the information they needed to get to understand if there might be a good fit or if they can get support from the organization. So, um, you know, yeah, and you're going to get a lot of no's as everyone tells you, right? So, um, you know, but if you queue up, you know, 10, 20 or, or targets uh, of those health innovation centers, you know, I'd be surprised if, you know, or I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, 10, 12 or more respond to your, your inquiry. Great, thank you. Wow, looks like we are about out of time. Thank you, Michael, so much. Um, thank you for all your information that you've given. And thanks to Commerce Bank, thanks to OHSU Oak Tree, and all of you for making today's Lunch and Learn so enjoyable and informative. Um, again, as I said, this program was recorded, so look for the recording in your email tomorrow, and I will attach Michael's slides. Thank you for that. And uh, we appreciate your support of OBI and hope you have a great rest of the week. Great. Thank you, Renee. And thank you, everyone, for, for, uh, for joining. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.